Listeners, I am back with Dr. J. Good, sir. Thank you very much, Amy. So happy to see you. Uh, LB, we did meet not very long ago at Ash, and that was an amazing meeting. It was an amazing meeting, and that's what we're going to talk about today. Tell me a little bit about Ash, maybe for our listeners who don't know what the conference is. Uh, what do you all do, and why is it important um, for you all as hematologists? Absolutely. American Society of Hematology um, hosts an annual conference uh, that features all the top research, uh, clinical developments, and brings together the think tank, if you may, of everything hematology under one roof. I think it's one of the biggest uh, draws for all hematologists, not just in North America, but all around the world. And I know, and this time in December uh, of 2023, we had it uh, uh, fortunately in our backyard in San Diego in Southern California with an audience of upwards of 40,000 people attending the meeting, which as you can imagine, um, uh, People invested in uh, 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 and presenting their research, uh, showcasing products around hematology, all under one roof. It was an amazing scientific discourse as something that we all, uh, um, as hematologists, just absolutely love and adore to attend and, and uh, participate. So it's an annual event, uh, more of a fair uh, than a meeting, a research meeting. But uh, we have another one coming up in December of 2024. And fortunately, this time again, uh, being repeated at the venue in San Diego. So we learned a lot. We presented a lot. And we did a lot of work around hematology uh, uh, at uh, ASH 2023 in San Diego. So tell the listeners a little bit about what some of your takeaways were in terms of bleeding disorder research. What was some of the discourse? What were some of the things that were presented that was interesting to you in terms of uh, hemophilia and von Willebrand's disease? Absolutely. I mean, I, you know, this meeting was such an eye opener because we all, uh, as clinical scientists and clinical practitioners in our little niche and in our little corners in the country and around the world, uh, 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 to help and work uh, around advancement for the field. But at ASH 2023, breaking perspectives all under one roof was something that we really take advantage of. So starting with one of a very unique uh, uh, presentation at ASH, uh, our American Society Hematology meeting, was uh, was work that has been done around bleeding disorders. So when we, when we say our bleeding disorder community, when we talk about classic hematology blood disorders, uh, we do talk about hemophilia, we talk about von Willebrand disease, but uh, there was a lot of focus this time around on uh, disorders um, that are of vascular origin, uh, uh, mm-hmm. that, that tend to be under-recognized. So all of those patients that we see in our clinic and around the world with chronic, for example, mucosal bleeding, such as nosebleeds, these patients with severe epistaxis, uh, these patients with severe mucosal gum bleeding, and when we do workup and we find that, hey, they're negative for von Willebrand disease, they are negative for workup for hemophilia A, B, or hemophilia C, uh, and other coagulation factor deficiencies, uh, having them uh, uh, put under a bucket of some of the other uh, uh, bleeding disorders uh, was something that was presented. Um, a study that had featured in utilization of some novel therapies in treating patients uh, with uh, with these inherited bleeding disorders uh, uh, on in adults a short significant improvement uh, specifically presenting as chronic recurrent refractory be they regular and not responding to regular therapy epistaxis was something that really caught my eye and certainly uh, I brought it home to my colleagues um, and, and helped educate some of our uh, providers at home to say hey don't call it, uh, 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 you know, let's not say that the patient may not have a bleeding disorder, but let's keep looking because there are more than one uh, prevalent uh, 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 diagnoses that could lead to the bleeding disorder. Um, some of the work that we presented, uh, which, was, which, which was around hemophilia, was uh, looking at outcomes in blood disorders for uh, people who are on emisusumab. Now, we know... And emisusumab uh, has found its uh, rightful place in treatment for hemophilia. But how does that impact uh, the hemoglobin? How does that impact anemia? 
those secondary outcomes that people with hemophilia suffer from. Um, and some of the work that we had done showed that there was significant improvement from baseline. Uh, some of the people didn't have anemia to begin with, but we know people with severe hemophilia do develop microbleeding, do have uh, chronic blood loss. Um, and an unintended but welcome, unintended but welcome consequence of the bleeding uh, of emesusumab was an improved hemoglobin and better iron metrics, uh, to which we got statistically significant values demonstrating that maybe an additional advantage of um, non-factor therapies is better bleed control, thereby less iron loss and maybe better anemias. Now that is more relevant for some of our carriers of hemophilia, women with hemophilia who are otherwise on not prophylaxis therapy, but certainly makes a case of having some of the focus when we are treating people with hemophilia to be on other comorbidities as well. Try to demonstrate that there is a role in looking at anemias, there is a role at looking at iron status, looking at quality of life, and certainly um, everything that comes as iron deficiency, anemia, or anemia gets worse in people with chronic bleeding disorders. So it was our first attempt to look at some uh, uh, off-target effects of emesusumab, which are positive and welcome, and something that certainly needs to be done in a bigger cohort uh, and, and internationally, not just the United States. So certainly that was um, something that we were really uh, happy that it was uh, shared and there was a lot of discourse around it. What about uh, drug development? Um, uh, thinking about bleeding disorder drug development, what what are some of the things that were coming out of some of the research? Um, pipeline discussions, um, research and studies. Tell us about Tell us about the products. Yeah, so... This meeting was very special because a lot of uh, discussion uh, focused around, again, we are sticking to classic hematology disorder, not blood cancers, uh, for the sake of our audience here and, and the discussion today. But this meeting was remarkable with uh, studies that had uh, demonstrated uh, work around gene therapy, not just for bleeding disorders, uh, for hemophilia uh, A and hemophilia B, which certainly were presented. You know, we and Dr. Steve Pipe presented the, the extended data on our, our, uh, the, the factor I Padua variant version of teaching therapy. And we now know that those initial patients who had who were the first few recipients of hemogenics or uh, um, our factor IX gene therapy uh, continue to have a sustained uh, factor nine expression, which is very welcome. Uh, we learned a lot around nuances of gene therapy in terms of uh, uh, liver irritation and transaminitis. We certainly learned a lot more about uh, the newer uh, factor eight gene therapies that are going to hit the market uh, uh, once the phase three data is approved and presented and was presented. It is it is interesting to see that we are evolving and refining what has now been set as a benchmark for hemophilia gene therapies, both for A and hemophilia B. So certainly, it drug development-wise, gene therapy stole the show for classic hematology disorders, uh, specifically around sickle cell disease, uh, uh, a disease that has been neglected for far too long, finally found it found its place with planetary sessions, which is like this big, almost a red carpet, Oscar-like uh, 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 attention. That was the center feature and literally the centerpiece of the meeting to talk about outcomes of gene therapy. Uh, one of my mentors, Dr. Banu Weigen, presented the work that their group had done around global access to care with sickle cell disease, uh, with the res their result in Africa pres being presented as a plenary session, which is a big deal. Uh, yeah. For it to be selected, for a plenary session and to see how the outcomes are faring for these children suffering from severe sickle cell disease in Africa and how it compares to what we are doing in the United States was an absolute motivation uh, and another high point of the meeting in December. Mm. Now, just to go back, Amy, the, the, the disorder, I think 
I think I mentioned the significant work on that bleeding disorder, which commonly gets under-recognized, but I mm-hmm. think uh, 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 we didn't talk about the disease. So it's hereditary hemorrhagic telangiectasia, HHT, tends to be, is, is an under-recognized disease. And uh, fascinating data demonstrated that after one Willebrand disease, it's the second most prevalent cause of inherited bleeding disorder. And uh, we, we, we don't talk about it often. We certainly don't screen for it. Uh, despite the fact that there are pre- excellent screening tests and clinical tools, scoring systems that are available and have been standardized over decades now that we should be paying more attention to. And with some of the drug developments demonstrating clinical benefit in a- these HHT patients, uh, I think we can certainly utilize that into our clinical practice. So yeah. uh, you, I just got reminded of it because hemorrhagic hereditary telangiectasia HHT is something that we absolutely need to talk more about. We can yeah. detect better. Uh, and we even have a genome sequencing panel that can be sent commercially for these patients. So it's not like a, a, a rare genetic test that only maybe seven labs around the world do it, but it's a commercially available test yeah. for certain genetic mutations. And I think the incidence of HHT is around 1 in 3,000. We know the incidence of one Willebrand disease is about 1 in 150 or 1 in 110 uh, humans, on, or at least in North, North America. But HHT was, I think, 1 in 2,000 to 3,000. And we know for hemophilia A, it's 1 in 10,000. So that puts it right in the middle, right after one Willebrand disease is the second most hereditary disorder that we don't... Uh, talk about as much. So I think that was a major takeaway from that meeting. Um, I want to thank you for being on the podcast today and giving us um, an update. Final question, I guess, what was your biggest provocative takeaway? What is something that uh, is a question that's still kind of marinating in your mind? Um, What was your what was your biggest question coming out of the meeting? I think more than a question, I think was a challenge. Uh, I am very fortunate to be involved in our training seminars or trainee seminars. So we do a lot of education for our next generation hematologists. And uh, what I saw in the next generation uh, trainees as part of our trainee program and educational curriculum and uh, program was a lot of excitement about what's happening around the world for hematology with gene therapy and, uh, and novel therapies like antithrombin and TFPI inhibitors and and, and, and Serpen FC and etc. Uh, but at the same time, uh, there is a, a discrepancy in pediatric trainees and, and adult hematology trainees. Um, while there is a lot of support around training for classic hematology in the adult hematology oncology training programs, with our pediatric trainees or people who have pediatric background who want to be a pediatric hematologist. Uh, I think we do do need to work and and motivate these folks a little better, support them a little mm-hmm. better, uh, so that groundbreaking research can be initiated. And it's these new upcoming uh, crop of hematologists uh, which will probably bro- bring on the next gene therapy or the next breakthrough to treat these disorders where we can finally say, hey, we have now found the holy grail. We have now found the cure for hemophilia. Um, so I think uh, it, wa- it it motivated me to gear up and create more funding opportunities and bring in more uh, accessible training opportunities and bring in equity to training our next generation of hematologists. Uh, and this meeting was a perfect avenue uh, to engage um, leaders, funders, and certainly uh, 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 our pharmaceutical uh, uh, industry support members to help train our trainees significantly more uh, and, and, and with equal equity. That, that really was really powerful for us. That sounds wonderful. That's, that's kudos to you, good sir. Um, thank you for being on the podcast again and offering um, an update from Ash, and we'll definitely have you on. At another time. Absolutely. Thank you, Amy. Thank you for having us. Uh, Absolutely. We'll be back. Absolutely. Thank you, Dr. Jane.